All right. Hello, and welcome to this very special episode of Absolutely Not. I am your host, Katrina Stroll. I am the founder and principal consultant for Failure Cup Consulting, and I created this space because so many professionals out there have difficulty setting boundaries, and I just don't want them to have that difficulty anymore. So this space is dedicated to providing examples of setting boundaries at work so they can use them at their place of work. Before we dive into today's topic, I'm going to start by defining some words that we use frequently on the show. The first being boundary, something that indicates or fixes a limit. A boundary, an example of a boundary would be a screen time boundary on your phone or um, technical devices that you go in there and make sure, oh, I can only use this device for three hours a day. That is a boundary you are setting with yourself. Gaslighting, to manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. An example of gaslighting would be if your manager tells you, hey, I need you to complete task A and B today, and then you report back to them and say, hey, I completed task A and B, what else would you like me to do? And they say, why would you do that? I never asked you to do that. That's such a ridiculous thing that you completed that task that's nowhere near the objective of today. That's gaslighting and also makes you feel psychologically, you question your own sanity. Dismissive, showing that something is unworthy of consideration. If you um, reach out to your manager or someone in your leadership team and say, hey, I have a concern, could we meet today about what I have a concern about? And they say, I don't have time for you today. They don't try to schedule another time. They don't try to indicate that um, they acknowledge your concern. They just say, I don't have time for you today. That would be dismissive. Today's episode is addressing unconscious bias at work. Yay, right? My special guest today is Stacy Gordon the absolute queen of unconscious bias at work. She has a whole book dedicated to it. Leading at the intersection of diversity, inclusion, and workplace culture in her role as executive advisor and diversity strat strategist, Stacey Gordon coaches and counsels executive leaders on DEI strategies for the business while offering a no-nonsense approach to education for the broader employee population. Yes. Stacey's book, Unbiased, Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work, debuted at number one on Amazon's hot new release list and is also available at Barnes and Nobles and wherever books are sold. Stacey is the creator of the second most viewed course across LinkedIn learning platform. Yes, surpassing more than one million unique learners, which also includes her popular resume course. Her unconscious bias course has been translated into at least four languages, and she has worked with people managers and executive leaders from companies such as American Express, ADP, Kia Motors, Hewlett Packard, Walmart, GE, and many others to deliver notable sessions that support their D&I efforts. She earned her MBA from Pepperdine University Business School and her SHRM Tash. S CP certification as well as the Sherm Inclusive Workplace Cultural Credential. Oh my goodness, what a rock star. Stacey, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm excited so, to be here. I'm so excited to have you as a guest. And I love that your bio touches that no nonsense that we at Absolutely Not love. So I cannot wait to dive into our topic today. Looking forward to it. I'm definitely no nonsense. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so let's talk about addressing um, unconscious bias at work. How does setting personal boundaries help with addressing those unconscious biases? Well, I think, you know, setting uh, boundaries is something that we struggle with, right? Just as um, working on DEI strategies is something that we struggle with. And um, it really boils down to communication. We suck at it. Um, our communication skills are not good. <laughs> so um, being able to, to tell somebody that you are mispronouncing my name incorrectly and I need you to stop it, right? Like that is a boundary that we need to set and it's also a DEI issue. Um, 
And I, I remember talking to a, a woman recently who was encountering this exact issue. And she was like, well, I don't know what to do anymore because I've just let it go. And she's like, it's too late to do anything about it. And I was like, no, it's not. It's your name. So you get to correct it, right? It doesn't matter the fact that you let it slip. I was like, you have to uh, correct this person who keeps mispronouncing your name. I said, because you know what? Everyone else around you who does pronounce your name correctly, now they think they're doing it wrong mm -hmm. because they're hearing you let this person pronounce your name wrong. And they're like, well, which is it? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Oh my gosh. That's such a great example because like, as we all know, boundaries are a way to tell people how you want to be treated. So if that person continues to let that behavior continue, they mispronounce their name or they, they don't want to hear about the boundary of pronouncing my name correctly, then you're letting other people know, oh, we can do whatever we want to her. She, she mm -hmm. does not care. It's fine. <laughs> And that's not the case, or at least we hope it's not the case. Right. Right. Okay. Um, so thank you for tying those two together. That's great to know that setting boundaries also helps organizations with their DNI. Um, I guess moving forward in that sense. What does a boundary mean to you? You know, I think boundaries are they're necessary. Um, they are. I was going to, the word that came in my head, I was thinking life-saving <laughs> because they really are like, sometimes you need boundaries. Like I have three children. Um, and if I don't set a boundary, I would be insane. I would not be able to deal um, with my kids. And so I have boundaries set so that I have time um, to be able to keep my sanity and to recharge so that I can be a good mom. Um, so I really think that the boundaries are important. Without them, we cannot be functioning human beings because people will always, right? What is that That phrase, give an inch, they'll take a yard. Um, <laughs> and that's just, cause that's just how we are as people. We're always like more, 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 more. So if we don't set boundaries, we're gonna always be depleted and always running out of steam. Oh my gosh. And Stacey, I love the life-saving phrase that you use because it very much is. Imagine just running on empty, running out of steam constantly. You're giving your life away to people and you're not saving it for yourself. My goodness. What a, what a visual presentation you just gave. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so it sounds like you don't have difficulty setting boundaries. Have you ever had difficulty setting boundaries? Oh, I have difficulty doing it. I mean, it's, it's hard, but I just know that it's necessary. <laughs> and so, um, and so I, I just know that it needs to be done. And I haven't usually had a problem saying the hard thing, um, but you still have like, especially, you know, I know we're talking a lot about work, but it, it's much, at least to me, it's easier to set boundaries at work than it is at home because, you know, uh, and again, speaking of me personally, I have kids. So there's always the mom guilt. Well, you're not doing enough. You're not showing up enough. You're not that, you know, and um, I was just talking to my sister about this yesterday. Like there is this narrative in, in place um, that as parents, not even just as moms, right? As parents that we're supposed to show up and like be the be all and end all for our kids. And that has changed because that never used to be the thing. I don't remember my, my parents taking me to the park and playing with me. I don't remember my, my parents, like they were at work, right? Like it was my job to entertain myself. Today though, I feel like there is this expectation that parents are supposed to, you know, it's self-sacrifice. We give up everything for our children. You know, we make sure that they, you know, we give up the food so they can eat. We, we give up the bed so they can sleep. We give up our time so they can go to hockey and football and, and, and volleyball. And we're flying them all over the place to do these things. And I'm just like, when did that become the standard that we are supposed to measure ourselves against? Because I'm not having it. <laughs> And I, I love that you use the word expectations and how they have changed over time for parents and their 
and how much they're involved in their children's lives. Um, just like boundaries, the expectations that society or whatever organization you're a part of set for you are ever changing. And it's important to realize that your boundaries need to change with those expectations just because society or Instagram or social media that you're viewing is saying, oh, as a parent and as a mom, you need to be there 24 seven with their child. Stacy, you have those boundaries in place saying, no, no, thank you. I have things to do. <laughs> so right. that's great. For sure. And I have three daughters, so they know, right? Like I'm, I'm also trying to role model behavior for them. Like, I don't want them to grow up and think that they have to be so self-sacrificing, be giving up everything for their kids should they decide to have kids, right? Um, I'm also not assuming that they will have kids. Be nice if one of them did, but hey. <laughs> and I love that self-sacrificing, once again, another visual um, presentation, because you're sacrificing yourself every time you let somebody cross your boundary or you don't have healthy boundaries set in place. You're just sacrificing yourself to whoever and whatever comes along. Um, and it's so important to kind of visualize that you sacrificing yourself and putting yourself in harm's way. Yeah. <clears throat> oh my gosh, that makes me want to cry just thinking about it, but I'll move forward. <laughs> um, so you still have difficulty setting boundaries. Um, but you do it nonetheless because it's necessary to do. Could you talk about a time you've had to set boundaries at work? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, I remember I, I worked with this one individual who uh, really wanted, it, it was interesting because he always would, it's kind of like what I said, like just wanting more and more and more. When you, when you show what you can do, then people want you to do more of it. And so I went into this job thinking like, okay, I'm going to do this and this and this and all these things. And I put all these expectations out there of all the things that I can do. And um, I finally realized that it was never enough, right? Because I would get it done, but then it was like, oh, well, if she can do that then she could do this too, right? And so there was just always this rising expectation. And I finally had to say, okay, stop give me, stop moving the goalpost, mm -hmm. right? Like up front, we set, we did our budget beginning of the year. This is what I said I was going to do. Why is it now towards the end of the year? We've added three programs. We've done this, we've done that. There's all these things that got put in that none of these were in the beginning, right? So it just, it was constantly adding in and adding in. Um, and I would just rise to the occasion and get it done because I am spectacular, right? I do get stuff done. <laughs> but I realized I was like, wait, you were just giving away like so much of your time and your energy and your mental ability. Um, and you're not getting paid any extra for it. So stop doing it. <laughs> oh, that last part, Stacey, you are not getting paid any extra for it. Um, and when we come to that realization is when we start to realize, yeah, you are just giving yourself for free, for no value. There's no reciprocation in there. Well, Lauren Hill, recipro reciprocity. Yes. Right. And, and uh, right. And it's not that it's not that that space of being like, well, it's not my job. I'm not going to do it. Right. That's a different conversation. This is I did my job. I went above and beyond my job. And you still want me to continue to go above and beyond and beyond and beyond my job, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you keep stating that we as human beings will take what we're given. The, per the party on the other side has no idea that you're getting burnt out, that you are overwhelmed, that the, you have limitations in place. They won't know that until you vocalize your boundaries and set those boundaries in place and have that conversation with them. So it's so important. Oh, um, and how did that conversation go with that person? You know, it, it was interesting because I had to have it several times, right? Oh. Like it, it would just, <laughs> I would just have to keep reinforcing the boundary. So it wasn't even that I kind of, it wasn't necessarily a conversation. It was more like, this is what's happening and I'm about to stop. <laughs> and I just need you to know. <laughs> oh, and I love that part because when we have to have that conversation five times, six times, seven times, that's when you know, oh, this person does not care about me as a person or a human being, or else they would have stopped. 
Yeah. And, and I think it was just not so much that they don't care, right? But it, it really is this idea that you're just going to continue to take, like you said, take what you're being given. So um, that's just, it, it, it's, it's you, you set the expectation for how people are going to treat you. And I always think about it because one of my first jobs, I worked for a really big law firm. And this was back in the day when, I don't even want to say, <laughs> I was going to say, it was okay to like treat uh, associates uh, really badly, right? And um, I wasn't an associate, I was a, a paralegal, but there was this, this partner uh, for this huge law firm and he was known for making uh, the, the new attorneys cry, right? He would literally like throw stuff at them. They would bring in their briefs. He would ball it up and throw it at their heads. He like threw a stapler at somebody. I mean, it was just abusive behavior, right? So I get called into this man's office and I was like, oh crap, I've never worked with him before. What does he want? Why does he even know who I am, right? Like these are the things that are going through my head. So I go to his office and he wanted me to do this, this research project. So I'm like, okay. And I asked him, what, what are your expectations? What do you need? I take the project, I go do it. I bring it to him. He liked it, we moved on. And people were like, wait, I, I don't understand. So you just did the project and it, that was, I'm like, yeah. And so after that, people kept coming to me and asking me to go talk to him about things. They'd be like, well, I have a question for him. Can you go ask him? <laughs> or I need to del deliver this document. Could you go give it to him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, why? Like, but I realized that he knew, right? You are not going to treat me that way. Because you throw a stapler at my head, best believe I'm going to pick it up and throw it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he just is like, people only do to you what you allow them. And he knew I wasn't going to allow that. And so um, there is this, this, what's the word I'm looking for? There's this aura sometimes that we do give off that kind of says like, I'm not the one, don't mess with me. <laughs> and, that, and that comes with our interactions with other people. It comes with um, how we're communicating to other people in that office, because for some reason that person um, believed it. He believed that you were not the one to mess with. And I'm glad he believed it. Throw a stapler, I'm, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's amazing that all the other people in your office saw that as admirable, but it also makes me really sad that they continue to live in fear. Like they saw that it was possible, but they were just like, okay, then we'll just utilize her instead. Right. Oh my gosh. But th that's why we have this conversation today so that everyone out here, anyone listening knows that um, that that admirable behavior that Stacy exhibited back then and that she exhibits now is possible for anybody in this room and anyone listening. You set the boundaries, you set the tone of how you want it to be, how you want to be treated as a human being. Yeah. Oh my gosh, thank you for sharing that so much. Um, could you share a time when you set a boundary and you received kickback or pushback when you set that boundary? Um. Gosh, I mean, I think you almost you always receive uh, pushback when you set a boundary, right? Because people are always going to be like, "But why? But can't you just right?" So that is the the, the pushback. But the answer is, well, no, I cannot just. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and here's why, you know, in the example of um, needing to, you know, being asked to kind of do more and do more and do more, um, you know, what I had to say was, I know you want me to do these extra things but it's not actually allowing me to do the, the things I need to do properly, right? I'm having to like half-ass it. I'm having to do it really quickly. I'm not able to do it to the depth that it needs to be done. And yes, on the surface, it looks great, but you know, I'm feeling the pressure of knowing just one little thing goes wrong and the whole house of cards is gonna fall down. So I'd rather not be in that situation and I'd rather take a couple of these things off my plate so that I can actually dig deep on these other things. And then we're still gonna make the same result, right? We're still going to uh, hit the target that we need to. So it was like, what's more important? Uh, impacting a lot of people on a really shallow level or maybe impacting a slightly smaller group of people on a deeper level, but knowing that we now have created customers for life, right? 
my gosh. And see, having those statements in place when you go to that person to talk about boundaries is so important because I'm sure the person on the other side, when they said why, or when they're, when they're giving that pushback, they weren't ready for you to have, okay, this is why we are not, right. <laughs> we needed to get data, it. Yeah. right? Always got to have data. You got to have, have your receipts. <laughs> it's like, this is what I'm working with. This is what it looks like. This is why we need to do this in this way. Right. So very important. And it's not only for that other person, um, because once again, we're not setting boundaries for anyone else. We're setting them for ourselves. But when we bring that data, we feel more confident in the boundary we're setting. Yes, this is something I'm setting to protect me at work. Awesome. Right. Awesome. I'm so glad you were able to set that boundary and that person was receptive and you had the data to show it. Um, I know that you have been this strong person your entire life, probably. Um, but a lot of people have, are going through this transition phase right now, and they're trying to grow into somebody who's able to set boundaries at work. Could you talk about your transition and what has helped you transition into the powerful powerhouse you are today? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with just knowing myself, right? Um, being more clear about what I want. When you're and that takes time. But when you're more clear about what you want, the beauty of that is you also know what you don't want. And so it's easier to say no to things and to be like, no, that does not serve me. No, I don't want to do that. No, I'm not interested. Um, but you can't do that when you don't know what it is that you do want. So when you're kind of wishy-washy and trying to still figure it out and, you know, and kind of hovering back and forth between a couple different things, it makes it difficult. Um, and so even in my business now, I, I always try to, you know, I struggle with it a little bit, but I'm still like, well, just because I can do something doesn't mean I should. <laughs> uh, and so I have to, even on in taking on clients, I'm like, is this a client that really is gonna advance our mission? Um, or is this something that we should just refer to somebody else? Mm, exactly. I love that you said, know what you don't want. I think so often we see examples of, oh, that's great leadership. That's an amazing organization over there. Um, but in our experience, we have been in those toxic environments. We have been a part of those dysfunctional organizations and we, it would be important to take away from those experiences. Okay, this is what I don't want. I, I, I love that you share that because I think so often we don't write those parts down. We write down, this is what I want moving forward, not what I don't want. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh, so very important. Okay, great. So knowing what you don't want has helped you move forward in setting boundaries. Um, what are your go-to phrases for setting boundaries? No. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. That is a good one. <laughs> Like I'm, I'm a big fan of no is a complete sentence, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I joke, right? Most people in a in a job can't just say no and walk away as much as we want to in our head, <laughs> right? Um, I, I, but I do think that no, I can't do this today, mm -hmm. but I could do it in a week, mm -hmm. right? No, I can't do this today. But Jenny's actually really good at that. Maybe you might want to check with her first, right? Or um, no, I can't do this because this does not um, fall within my specialty. Mm -hmm. And I think you might want to find somebody else who would be more aligned with this project. <laughs> And that word align means so much to me just because make, ensuring that it's aligned with your values, your mission, everything that you're doing in your business. So that's great. That's a great part of saying no, no, because you don't align with me. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, lastly, what are the top three tips you would share with new professionals out there that are looking to move into your field of DEI or looking to just move into corporate America on setting boundaries at work? Yeah, I think um, it's knowing what you want, right? Um, so like if I said specifically for getting into DEI, because so many people do want to get into this work, um, specifically for that, I would say know what it is, right? Like don't accept a job uh, just because 
you're black or just because you're a woman or just because because that's what's happening right now, right? Mm -hmm. You are the product manager at XYZ company and you happen to be black. And they're like, oh, you've been pretty vocal lately. Would you like the job of chief diversity officer? Okay, well, if, if you know, <laughs> that's uh, a question you really have to ask yourself. Do I want that job, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what is that going to look like? So it really goes back to what do you want? Um, and then also knowing what are the expectations of the, the role? Because you might not be able to meet somebody's expectations. You might not want to meet somebody's expectations. It's like, if this is what you are expecting in this role, I am not the person for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so just knowing that, you know, not all, mon not all money is good money. So yeah, they might be throwing a lot of money at you, but it's like, how long are you going to be in that job, right? Can you be successful in it? Because do you really want to be that person who's going to jump in, take it, and then they'll be like, oh yeah, she failed after hmm. six months, and then they fire you, right? Which is what's happening for a lot of DEI people. Um, but I would say in general, just when you're looking for, you know, a job and you're looking to advance, I would say, yeah, know what the expectations are, mm -hmm. because that is what will make or break you um, is it always looks shiny and new and great, but find out what is it that they actually are expecting you to deliver. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's something you want to do and aren't sure how to deliver, then go find out, <laughs> right? Like figure that out. Mm -hmm. Before accepting that position, because <laughs> once you're in it, just like you said, then they're going to expect things from you. A lot of the people moving into that chief diversity um, officer position after being just an associate at the organization are starting to realize, oh my gosh, they're asking me to flip this whole place upside down and do things that I've never done before. Right. And not to say you shouldn't right, take that stretch assignment, right? Um, but it's just, like I said, that's why knowing what the expectations are and then knowing what your resources are that you have to help you with meeting those expectations. I had a friend who was looking at a, a new role and she's like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this job. And I was like, girl, accept the job and you've got a whole tribe of people right here who will help you. Whatever you need, you just gotta let us know, we'll help you, right? So um, just knowing that you have support is gonna help with that too. So very important, having support um, specifically outside of that organization. So that way you can get a clear idea of okay, um, I know that I have Stacy in my back pocket and she will tell me, or she will have a visual presentation for me on what I need to do moving forward. Man, Stacy, you have been amazing during this interview and shared so much. Um, I am now going to open it to the floor to see if anybody in the room has questions. If you do have questions, feel free to come off mute or use the chat box. And Stacy is now in the hot seat and she will answer any questions about unbiased, or setting boundaries at work. I know it's always uh, nerve wracking and, and many of the individuals here might not have read my book yet. So I will say, please go read my book. <laughs> <laughs> unbiased addressing unconscious bias at work Katrina has her copy which I appreciate uh, we are working to uh, get more eyeballs on it um, and if even if you don't purchase a copy maybe share it out there um, oh, I love that Emmett has a, a question that says how do we handle age bias you know what this is so I love that you say you're younger because I was gonna say that um, age bias, especially for older individuals, is one that people don't talk about a lot. But you are correct that um, this age bias in general is one that people don't talk about a lot because it's so easy to uh, go under the radar. You know, when I was consulting way back in the day, I remember a woman walked up to me and actually patted me on the head and said, oh, but you're just a baby. <laughs> And it was like, wow, did that just happen? Yes, it did. <laughs> so, um, you know, in terms of how, how do you handle it? 
uh, you know, you have to, it, it depends, right? If you're in the interviewing stage, right? Looking for a job, it is reinforcing that you know what you're talking about. I'll be honest, it's one of the reasons I went back to school to get an MBA because I was so tired. I was like, I need something after my name, some kind of letters, something that show that I know what I'm talking about because I say these things till I'm blue in the face and no one's listening. So, you know, it might be getting some additional education. Uh, it might be having somebody who people do respect uh, vouch for you, right? And being able to say, yeah, he's young, she's young, but um, I can definitely uh, vouch for them. They can do this work. This person can do the job. Um, so I would say that, that getting recommendations, that is really helpful. Um, and then let's see what else would I say. Getting recommendations would be helpful. Um, not that I'm, I'm not, because the, the cost of education at this point, I'm not recommending that everybody goes back to school, but it might be, you know, doing some extra side courses like using Udemy, using Coursera, using LinkedIn Learning. Uh, while you're there, you can check out one of my courses. <laughs> Um, so those are some ways to get some quick, uh, you know, education. Sometimes it's getting a certification. Um, I did get my, my SHRM SCP certification, uh, mostly because I had worked in like the HR industry for a while and I thought, oh, let me just get it. But has anyone ever said to me, Stacy, I can't work with you because you don't have a certification? No. But has anyone actually, what I would prefer is the other side is someone says, hey, now that you have it certification we're that's why we're working with you right doesn't happen um but it does just add to the idea that you must know what you're talking about so unfortunately that is the um the world that we live in and i wish it wasn't that way that we could just work off of the experience that we bring to the table and Emmett, I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much for asking it. If anyone else has questions, please type it in the chat or come off mute. I will offer yes, that. well, and you know what? So the, the comment there is that uh, he looks like a teenager. When they realize I do know my stuff, it's like they shy away and they say you're too smart and definitely going to do more networking. Networking, yes. You know, it, it's the... I, I, I'm, I'm constantly saying we need to work on our biases, right? But the biggest bias out there is affinity bias and the idea that we like people who are like us um, and we just have that connection. We have this human connection. Um, and so when you are out networking and getting to know people um, and having them get to know you and learning more about who you are and what you can do, that is absolutely um, the best thing that you can do because they are going to be able to advocate for you on your behalf, especially when you're not in the room, right? When you're not there, somebody can say, oh, well, what about Emmett? They're, they're really good at this particular thing. Why don't you get them to do it, right? Oh, that's um, Walter asked, how can an individual address an unconscious bias in hiring of only a person who act, behave like themselves? Ooh, wow. Yes. Um, so, I mean, this is a, a deep question, right? Um, it, it's part of it is getting to know people. So like what Emmett is saying is going out and networking, same thing. We have to network outside of our normal group of people. So uh, I always do a, a, a um, exercise with people where I have them do their top five, right? And like, who are the top five people that you talk to all the time that you go to for advice that are people like they're your ride or die right who are those five people and if you look at those five people are they all white are they all male right are they all able-bodied are they all cisgender right so like that's what you have to look at and if that's the case then you actually intentionally need to go meet new people you need to get out and network and broaden your network and go meet people who look different than you. So for me, I need to go talk to more white men. I need to go talk to more Asian people. I need to go talk to, you know, uh, more people in, in the LGBTQ um, uh, community. I need to talk to people who are in a wheelchair, right? I need to talk to somebody who might have a, a mental or a cognitive impairment. Like these are all um, 
dimensions of diversity that we just completely forget about and don't have to think about because we have the privilege of being able-bodied, walking around, doing whatever we wanna do and not thinking about those individuals who maybe don't have that luxury. So um, especially if you're recruiting, it's gotta widen the network and, um, and not only widen the network, but then create deeper relationships, get to know people. So you wanna do the, both wide and deep. I'm really, I love that top five people. If they all look alike, then you need to, wow, that is very eye-opening and also just hurts my heart a little bit. <laughs> Well, and it's not like, you know, we like to pick on white men and say, oh, well, it's the white men. They all, you know, but I look at my own network. It's the same. My top, my top three are probably all black women. Right. Um, but knowing that it means when I am working to hire, when I'm working to include people, I have to be intentional. Right. My go to is to call up one of my girls and be like, hey, do you want to do this? And I have to stop myself and say, hey, maybe give somebody else a shot. <laughs> Right. Wow, that is amazing. And uh, we'll, I will keep that in the front of my brain for the rest of my life <laughs> or try to. You intentional deep in connection. Yes, Walter, you're doing great, Walter. Um, I don't see any more questions, but I have so many more questions to ask you. Um, <laughs> Hi, I don't know if I can oh. jump in. Oh, go ahead. Um, so I'm Deborah and I'm a teacher and I've been volunteering for uh, my organization and the community talking about um, diversity and inclusion and I just want um, to know how do you deal with you know the negativity and you know sometimes I feel so discouraged <laughs> and um, so you know there's so much to do and I just 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 want some advice on how you you deal with these things you know <laughs> yeah I mean you you have to have a, a it really helps to have a network of people um so last Monday I don't know what was going on in my head I don't I have no idea I probably just had a really hard week the week before and I got into my office and I was like I just I couldn't even get work done. I was just frustrated. I was pissed off. I was like, it just, nothing's working. And I called one of my friends. I was like, I need a virtual hug. I need a pep talk. I need to get out of this funk. Somebody help me, please. <laughs> and so just knowing that I have people that can help with that, because the first person I called, she was like, I'm sorry, I'm in a meeting. I was like, well, damn, I need backup right now. I know it's Monday morning. Somebody help me. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to have that group of people who know, right, what you're going through and that you can vent to and that you can let it out and they can remind you that you are doing great work and that you can't change everybody. And, um, and then you have a little cry if you have to. You punch a wall, right, have some coffee, whatever beverage of choice and then you get up and go okay now when that little tantrum's over let's get back to work <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you and that goes back to your boundaries Stacey you immediately knew what you needed you needed that pep talk you needed that virtual hug um so you went to the resources you have available that's awesome oh I love it does anyone else have any questions for Stacey all right looks like we are hopefully that means i've answered your questions or you're deep in thought which is also good um, which so. is also good but i um as we get to the end of this session i would love to ask you do you have any golden nuggets you'd want anyone else out there to hear about setting boundaries or moving into dei um yeah, I think I, I think I, I've given you all the nuggets. Um, so I'll, I'll just reiterate the main one, I think, which is that knowing what it is that you want is is vital. Um, and and that what you want can change and that that's OK. <laughs> because sometimes we say this is what I want. I want this thing. 
and you're going hard for this thing. And then at some point you're like, I don't want this thing anymore, but I already told everybody I want it. And I already started down the path and I'm already halfway there. So I guess I should keep going. And it's like, it's okay to stop and pivot and be like, you know what? I was apparently wrong. This is not what I want. <laughs> Um, but you know, I think what is, is really why that happens is because I think of it like a ladder, right? Like if you start climbing a ladder, you can't see what's at the top of the ladder unless you start to climb the ladder. So you got to start somewhere, right? You have to start climbing and it's just, as you're climbing, you know, and you're going up all of a sudden you go, oh wait, I'm on the wrong ladder. Let me scoot, right? Let me <laughs> But you won't know that unless you climb the ladder. Otherwise, you'll just be stuck on the ground, wow. right? And you'll go nowhere. So, <laughs> oh gosh, I love that so much. Uh, I'm on the wrong ladder. If you are climbing the wrong ladder right now, if you're listening to this and Stacy's words have hit you right in the chest, and you, oh my gosh, I am on the wrong ladder. Go ahead, listen to Stacy and get off the ladder. Climb right back down and start a new ladder. It's okay. Man, I love that so much. And I'm, I'm so happy that anybody who's listening to this, whether young or old, is able to hear that right now. Get off that ladder and get on another ladder. Because I think so often, just like you said, we have told everybody about this brand new shiny ladder that we're climbing. And we just feel so pressured to not share the fact that we don't want this ladder anymore. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for one, being a special guest today. And for two, sharing so many insights today on DEI, on ladders, on boundaries, and just being an amazing mom, human being, entrepreneur, all of the above, and number one author. Like, you are doing amazing things out here, Stacy, and I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to be on Absolutely Not. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it, it was number one when it first released. It's no longer number one, but you all can help with that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my plug. Purchase a copy, please, and purchase a copy for a friend. <laughs> we do it, and it's an amazing read. I'm still getting through it, but it is amazing. She is amazing, so you know it's going to be amazing. Um, once again, this has been absolutely not all about setting personal boundaries at work. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am your host, Katrina Stroll, and I will see you next time. Bye.